Danger can strike anywhere, even in seemingly safe places. This video reveals five chilling stories of tourists who met tragic ends while visiting Europe. Each case holds a touch of mystery. Join us as we delve into these disturbing tales and attempt to shed light on their dark secrets. On July 18, 2016, Mike Mansholt, a spirited 17-year-old adventurer passionate about the outdoors, sports, and travel, embarked on a holiday in Malta. The year before, he had joined his father on a challenging canoeing expedition along the Yukon River in Canada. But this trip was different. This was Mike's first holiday alone, without the comforting presence of his family. It was meant to be an exhilarating experience, a milestone in his journey toward independence. However, what began as an exciting adventure soon took a dark and unexpected turn. Mike's girlfriend was in Malta for a language course, and they spent a few delightful days together before she returned to Germany. But Mike's thirst for adventure urged him to stay and explore more of the country. Equipped with his gray backpack, a few hundred euros, a power bank, a straw hat to shield him from the intense sun, and his trusty GoPro camera, Mike was ready to document his solo journey. The GoPro was essential, capturing the essence of his adventures and preserving memories of what he hoped would be an unforgettable trip. On Monday, July 18, 2016, the German teenager left his hotel room on his rented bike. Before leaving his room, though, Mike sent his father a voice message on WhatsApp, letting the man know about his plans. Mike promised to send a picture shortly. He talked about how steep the roads were. But, Mike said, he was ready for the sporting challenge. He liked that. Then, off he went. Mike never sent his father that picture. A day later on July 19th, he still needed to return the rented bike. On July 22nd, the teenager didn't show up at the airport. He never got on the plane and never landed at Bremen Airport in Germany, as expected. That's when 17-year-old Mike Manscholt was reported missing, prompting a police search. His family was alerted, and they traveled to Malta to join the effort, desperate to find Mike. On the morning of July 26th, Eight days after his disappearance, Mike's body was finally found at the foot of Dingley Cliffs. It appeared that Mike died from a fall, plunging 29 meters from the cliffs, or 11 stories below street level. He was lying in a rock depression. His rented bike hung in a bush a few feet up. His sunglasses and shoes were farther down. There was no trace of his backpack or his other belongings. Mike's father, Bernd Mansholt, was taken to the site. A police inspector told him Mike was lying peacefully. A doctor at the scene claimed Mike's back was broken in two places. The body was taken to the morgue for an autopsy. The news devastated Mike's father, friends, and family. But he was finally glad to know the truth. And they were happy to know Mike died doing something he loved. Their peace was extremely short-lived. Confusing details abounded. And the Maltese authorities were behaving strangely. Bernd went to the morgue wanting to find out more about the circumstances of his son's passing. He'd heard the doctor saying Mike's back was broken on the scene, but there was more to discover. Once Bernd arrived at the morgue, however, a staff member took him aside and revealed something shocking. There were no fractures. First, the damage to Mike's bike did not align with a fall from such a great height. The bike was barely damaged, showing only a flat tire and a misaligned seat. But what was even more perplexing was the absence of Mike's belongings. When Bernd Mansholt inquired about his son's items, the police handed him an old Canon camera, attempting to pass it off as Mike's GoPro. Bernd knew it wasn't his son's. When he pointed this out, the police did not explain. But it didn't end there. Eventually, Mike's body was returned to Germany. His family took the body to the Medical University of Hanover for a second autopsy. They found out that most of Mike's organs were missing, except for his left kidney, diaphragm, spleen, and large intestine. Mike's body weighed only 32 kilograms or about 70 pounds. He hadn't been embalmed, though the law states bodies have to be embalmed to be returned to their home countries. Mario Scarry, a Maltese forensic specialist, claimed that rodents had consumed Mike's organs and that his body had been embalmed under his supervision. However, German specialists contradicted this, finding no bite marks on the body. They noted that remnants would still be present if the brain had liquefied. They couldn't rule out third-party involvement in Mike's death, excluding blunt force trauma or projectile injury, but not suffocation or internal bleeding due to the body's condition. The mystery deepened as conflicting reports left many questions unanswered. With all these shocking findings, 
burnt Mansholt started questioning the Maltese authorities. They were closed off and dismissive. They claimed a tourist must have stolen Mike's belongings and argued the Maltese did not do these kinds of acts. It wasn't until April 2018, over a year after Mike's body was found, that Burnt received the entire file. However, the inquiry's conclusion remained unchanged. Mike probably died from a fall. The German prosecutor's investigation suggested that Mike's fall might have been broken by trees, explaining the lack of severe injuries. This contradicts the Maltese findings regarding the missing organs, which the German prosecutor insisted were intact when Mike was found. Bernd Manscholt returned to Malta time and time again, trying his best to fight for answers and justice. In 2021, he went to court to obtain a European investigation order. As of now, the circumstances of Mike Manscholt's death are still unknown. In July 2017, Bakari Henderson enjoyed a well-deserved vacation in Zakynthos, a renowned Greek island in the Ionian Sea. Bakari, a 22-year-old black man from Austin, Texas, had recently graduated from the University of Arizona with a degree in finance and entrepreneurship. Full of ambition, he was on the verge of launching his clothing line. Before diving into his business venture, Bakari wanted to celebrate his graduation with friends, and Zakynthos, with its sunny beaches and vibrant nightlife, was the perfect destination. The island, Famous for attracting tourists from around the globe, promised an unforgettable celebration. Bakari and his friends were enjoying their vacation, starting in pure bliss. They discovered a hidden cliff diving spot, unknown to most tourists, where they spent their days having the time of their lives. Bakari was the group's heartbeat, always ready to drop everything to help a friend. Known for his calm demeanor and likable personality, he had a knack for handling whatever life threw at him. The vacation was a perfect celebration, filled with unforgettable moments and adventures. But being a young black man in America has its own rules. Perhaps that's why Bakari Henderson enjoyed traveling so much. He felt safer overseas as if those rules were not as applicable. After a thrilling day of cliff diving, Bakari and his friends were eager to experience the nightlife in the Laganas area of Zakynthos. Known as the island's party zone, Laganas is packed with bars and nightclubs, drawing a vibrant crowd of young tourists looking to dance the night away. The friends were ready to immerse themselves in the energetic atmosphere, hoping to cap off their adventurous day with an unforgettable night of celebration. A Serbian waitress invited 22-year-old Bakari and his friends to one of the nightclubs. They had no idea the night would turn from bliss to agony. A few hours after midnight, around 3 a.m. local time, the Serbian waitress began talking to Bakari Henderson. They decided to take a selfie together, a seemingly harmless action. However, a nearby Serbian man took offense, his anger quickly escalating. He shouted at them, questioning why she was talking to a black man, given the presence of many Serbians in the bar. The situation rapidly deteriorated as the visibly angry and aggressive man escalated the conflict by punching Bakari. Bakari tried to defend himself, but it soon became clear that the aggressive man wasn't alone in his sentiments, as several other white men joined in. Bakari ran out of the bar, closely chased by about 10 men. It all happened so fast. The men quickly surrounded Bakari and started beating him. A CCTV camera recorded the men, several Serbs, a Greek and a British citizen, repeatedly punching and kicking Bakari's head. By the time his friends reached him, Bakari was dead. Nine of Bakari's attackers were identified and brought to trial a year later in 2018. None of them were convicted of murder. Six were found guilty of deadly assault, a less severe charge. Three others were freed. Bakari's family was devastated by this decision. A Greek prosecutor agreed and ordered a retrial, a move made possible because Greece doesn't have double jeopardy laws like the US. Kamala Harris took a personal interest in the case and discussed it with Greece's prime minister. The retrial faced multiple delays, but in 2022, a Greek court upheld the original convictions. By then, five of the convicted men had already been released and the sixth man also had his sentence reduced. In early November 2014, Sylvia Rajchel was living out her most prominent dream. The 23-year-old from Lublin, Poland, had finally reached Seville, Spain, a place she had longed to visit for years. Spain had always captivated her, and she had dedicated herself to learning the language, eagerly anticipating the day she could use it in her native country. 
Her trip to Seville was more than just a vacation. It was the realization of a cherished aspiration and a testament to her determination and passion for experiencing the culture she had come to love. And now, here she was. Sylvia Reichel was a beautiful young woman with long black hair and striking blue eyes, always smiling. She was a dedicated medical student at the University of Medicine in Posada, a village in Poland, aspiring to become a nurse. Currently on an Erasmus scholarship at the University of Murcia, Sylvia was determined to complete her studies and fulfill her dream of moving to Spain to practice her beloved profession. Her passion for nursing and her unwavering dream of living in Spain were well known to all her loved ones. Sylvia was visiting Seville, the largest city in Andalusia, on a trip organized by an association. A little after midnight on Sunday, November 2nd, the young woman found herself on Puente de Triana, one of Seville's most iconic landmarks. Puente de Triana is an impressive metal arch bridge completed in 1852. It is a national historic monument that offers one of the city's best panoramas. In other words, the bridge is a tourist magnet, and tourists like nothing more than taking photos of their travels. Sylvia Reichel was no different. The young woman was on the bridge when she decided to take a photo of herself, a truly memorable selfie. She climbed the metal ledge of the bridge. Teetering on the ledge, she got out her phone and tried to snap a photo of herself. Her whole life changed in a flash. Suddenly, the young woman lost her balance. She fell backward approximately 15 feet before hitting a concrete footing below the bridge. Witnesses of the tragic accident immediately called an ambulance. By the time paramedics arrived, the 23-year-old nursing student was already in cardiac arrest, teetering on the brink of life and death. She had also fractured the base of her skull. Despite the paramedic's ability to revive her and transport her to the Hospital of Traumatology, her injuries were too severe. Despite their best efforts, Sylvia Rajchel ultimately succumbed to her injuries. Her parents struggled to come to terms with their daughter's tragic accident and death. Sylvia's misfortune, however, prompted city authorities to reevaluate the safety of Seville's citizens and tourists. The sad incident made the city focus on making the stretch of boulevards along the river safer for everyone. In April 2019, Patrick McGuire, his wife Anna, and two of their friends embarked on a short vacation to Scotland. Patrick and Anna, Americans from Wisconsin, were excited to explore the country's rich history and scenic beauty. At 67, Patrick was a beloved university professor, inspiring thousands of students to appreciate and embrace the world of literature. His passion for teaching and profound knowledge have impacted countless lives, making him a cherished figure in the academic community. This trip was a much anticipated adventure for Patrick and Anna, a chance to create new memories in a land steeped in literary tradition. Patrick was a witty person who loved the company of other people. He was considered a great conversationalist, but the man also appreciated the solitude and the beauty he could discover. On the evening of April 13th at about 10.30 p.m., the man decided to spend some time alone. His group stayed at the Glengarry Castle Hotel in the Scottish Highlands a family-owned Victorian hotel overlooking the beautiful Loch Oik. 67-year-old Patrick McGuire exited the hotel, planning to take photographs and enjoy a cigarette. Even back home, Patrick's favorite times were sitting on the porch looking at the stars. Two benches were outside the hotel, placed on the grass near its walls. They were Victorian cast-iron benches, heavy and robust. Patrick headed toward one of them, planning to take a seat. What he didn't know, however, was that two years before, the hotel had embedded wooden blocks in the grass to stabilize the benches and prevent them from sinking into the grass. Patrick McGuire sat down on the cast iron bench. Naturally, he then leaned back. He didn't see it coming. As he leaned back, the entire bench tipped backward. As he fell, the man hit his head on the wall. The bench weighed around 72 kilograms or about 158 pounds. Patrick was trapped, unable to move the bench. Some two hours later, Anna, Patrick's wife, was ready to retire to her room when she realized Patrick never returned. Anna called him, but he didn't pick up. She decided to look for her husband, but he wasn't inside the hotel. The woman went outside to search the hotel grounds. That's when she found Patrick trapped against the wall. He wasn't moving. His head was up against the wall. His neck was bent forward and his chin was on his chest. Patrick wasn't breathing and he had no pulse. Anna called emergency services, but Patrick McGuire was already dead, a victim of a devastating, strange incident. 
A subsequent investigation found that a 2017 audit commissioned by hotel management did not identify them as posing any specific health and safety risks. Moreover, a later inspection by a health and safety executive, HSE inspector, concluded that the bench was structurally sound and fit for purpose, provided it was founded on a hard surface. The hotel's owners were initially fined 21,000 pounds. Still, since they assumed responsibility at the earliest possible time, the sum was reduced to 14,000 pounds. The two Victorian benches, which had been in use for 60 years at the moment of the incident, were removed and replaced with wooden benches to prevent another incident from happening. Sheriff Gary Aitken told reporters that no one goes on holiday expecting not to return, and one would assume there are few activities with lower risk than sitting outside a Highland hotel to smoke a cigarette and enjoy the evening. In March 2024, just before Easter, Storm Nelson wreaked havoc across parts of Spain and the UK. Southern Spain bore the brunt of the storm, with fierce gusts of wind, torrential rainfall, and towering angry waves threatening to dampen the Easter celebrations. Due to the severe conditions, Spain's state weather agency was compelled to activate a risk alert. Despite these warnings, many people had already made their travel plans and were determined to spend Easter in Spain, hoping for a festive holiday amidst the turbulent weather. The storm cast a shadow over the celebrations, but the resilient spirit of the travelers and locals alike shone through as they prepared to face the challenges brought by Storm Nelson. Such was the case for a 62-year-old British man named John. He and his partner had traveled from the United Kingdom to Spain, hoping for mild weather during their holiday. Despite the storm's unexpected arrival, they had chosen Spain, seeking a peaceful and enjoyable getaway. On Wednesday, March 27th, the couple traveled approximately 200 miles from Valladolid to the small, charming village of San Esteban de Pravia in Muros de Nalón. They were on holiday with friends and planned to spend a week in the picturesque town, enjoying the local scenery and relaxing atmosphere. It was John's first time visiting the area. Soon after their arrival, the couple headed to the apartment they were renting. There, they spoke to the woman from whom they rented the flat. She made sure to let them know about the upcoming bad weather. Despite the bad weather and adverse coastal phenomena, the couple decided to make the most of their trip. The next day, on March 28, 2024, the couple explored the city and took pictures. Their friends weren't with them. It was about 1 p.m. when they decided to walk on a breakwater. But when they reached the end of the structure, a rogue wave knocked John off his feet, which caused him to hit his head and right into the water. The angry waves did the rest. They dragged John away from his terrified wife and away from safety. The man's wife alerted authorities. The emergency service of the principality sent a helicopter and a team of firefighters to search for the man. An hour later at 2 p.m. that Thursday, John's body was located in the San Esteban estuary. The body had to be evacuated by helicopter, and authorities had to use a crane mechanism in which almost 100 feet of cable were deployed. John's remains were then brought back to the breakwater, where the city guard took charge of the situation. An autopsy was then scheduled for the following day to determine the actual cause of death. The man's wife had to deal not only with the heartbreak of losing her husband, but also with the false rumor that her husband had fallen while taking a selfie. The rumor sparked some unwanted and painful internet hate. In a letter published by a Spanish paper, a woman clarified that John was not one of those who lost his life while trying to take a photo or selfie. She emphasized that this was not the case and expressed her hope that John's death would not be in vain. She urged investment in an effective warning system to alert people about the dangers in the area.